I'm building a 12 inch joiner and for the beds, I'm modifying what used to be the cast iron extension wings from a table saw. These come from a rigid TS3650, the same model saw that I have. They do have this partial open web, which is not desirable. On my saw, I filled that in with the plywood. I'm going to do the same thing, except I'll be a little bit more careful about it. And I'll skin that with some sheet metal. Now I got these off of Craigslist for very cheap because they were off of a saw that was not functioning and was very rusty. I cleaned them up with Evaporust and they're still pitted and stained. They're not beautiful, but they are very flat. And I would be hard pressed to have done a DIY version with plywood and sheet metal for less than what I paid for these. You can buy some new cast iron wings from SawStop and they don't have this open web, so they'd be perfect. Uh, they're about $300 and I wouldn't have a problem spending that kind of money, except I wasn't sure what's going to happen when I cut into them, because uh, you do have to cut into them to make room for the cutter head. I feel a lot better about cutting into some rusty Craigslist junk than I do about spending that kind of money and then maybe immediately destroying them. So now that I've been the guinea pig, you can have a little bit more confidence if you want to do this. So the next thing I'm going to do is grind this back so that they're straight. Well, shit. It's kind of like grinding a new bevel on a giant chisel. I had two sheets of 18 millimeter Baltic birch cut at 33 and a half inches at the lumber yard. Here I'm cutting them to length at 46 inches. That length makes the off cuts wide enough for the pieces that run the width of the joiner. Now I'm sketching out the curves of the side panels to make sure what I drew in CAD looks good in reality, but those aren't the lines I'm going to use for the cutting. It would be difficult to sand the curves on these large pieces, so instead I made a couple of templates. After roughing it out with a jigsaw, I'll use a flesh trim bit to make it the final shape. I can use the first one as a template to make the second one. Now I want to double up the thickness. I ripped one of the remaining pieces in half to get the upper part, and then pieced together the rest from the cutoffs of the first layer. It may seem like adding these curves made for a lot of waste, but in reality, there was actually very little. Now here is the cutter head. This is the end the pulley goes on, and I was hoping I was gonna be able to use the pulleys from the table saw, but this is a much smaller 5 8 bore. This is 30 millimeters. Here in the US, metric bore pulleys are hard to come by, so I've had to order the pulleys from the joiner that this cutter head is meant to go in. I've also ordered the bearing housings, and this is going to spread out the load from that little bearing to a much larger surface area on the wooden frame. Now on this end, the bearing goes on this turn down section of the shaft, and I have no idea why they extended this shaft out like this compared to the other side. Um, I don't want that extension here, so this housing is meant to go here, what I'm going to do is flip it around so that it extends out like that. I make the cutouts for the bearing housings with a router and a circle guide. Well, I'm frustrated. I'm at the point where all of the parts theoretically are here and I should be able to just put everything together in a few days and be done. But in reality, I'm just finding where all the little problems are and a big problem. So um, these bearing housings have a little bolt that goes in the bottom. 
and the parts diagram said they were M10 by 1.25. So I ordered some M10 by 1.25 bolts. They don't fit. They're actually supposed to be M10 by 1.5. So that's not a really big deal. Just go to the hardware store and get some new bolts. Then I went to put the bearings on the shafts and this one, this side went okay, went on hard. Um, so this side I planned a little bit better and I, um, normally I would stick this in the freezer, but it's just too big. So I stuck this end in an ice bath and then put it on and it went on like way easy. Okay. Just shouldn't have been that easy, but also it went on too far. It went on so far that it, like, the housing hits the cutters, and that's not right. So, um, and I don't understand that. Like, I still, I've, it's a couple days later, and I, I don't understand why that is. Like, step one in the instructions is put that housing on as far as it will go. And it doesn't work. So, I don't get it. But I can, I can work around that. So I made a little wooden spacer that can go on there and shift it over. But with everything warmed up to room temperature, that bearing still slides on the shaft. It's just machined wrong. So that's a big problem. So this, you can see that goes almost touching the edge of this. And I, I've taken the cutters off the end of this. If that cutter was on there, it would be touching this housing. And then this pulley doesn't have any set screws. The way this is supposed to be held on is it butts up against the bearing and there's a hole, a tapped hole in the end of this. And there's supposed to be a washer and a screw that hold this. And like, there's an extra half inch of shaft here. And I just, I don't understand what's going on here. And there's like nothing on the parts diagram that I'm missing, but I'm missing something here. So if I put a little spacer in there, That would get it right, but I'm not going to use these pulleys because the one that goes on the motor is for a 7 8 bore, and my motor has a 5 8 shaft, and the belt is just super long. It's... I've put a lot of thought into what mechanism to use for raising and lowering the infeed table. On the commercial market, there's two solutions dovetail ways, like this one, and the parallelogram. They're both viable options for an infinitely adjustable table. But is an infinitely adjustable table really the best solution for me? I say no, because this table is very easy to move up and down, but I hardly ever use that feature, because it's very difficult to tell what it's actually set to. And I don't care what the precise value is, I just want to either take a normal cut or a light cut or a heavier cut than normal. So I would much rather have discrete settings for progressively heavier cuts that were really obvious what it was set to. Because if I set this down for a heavy cut and then I forget about it and I don't set it back, the next time I go to use it, I get a nasty surprise. And so I just, I never use that. I had the idea of having the table sitting on top of four cams, a pair in the front and a pair in the back. And so you'd just adjust this lever to raise and lower the two ends independently. And there's a little spring in here that forces this lever back into these notches. What I'm not showing here is because this table is just floating around on here, there would be four knobs that you have to loosen and tighten every time you want to adjust this. I've rejected this idea though because if I were to lower the front cam while the back cam was still up, that puts the table at an angle and lowers it right into the cutter head. And that falls into the category of very bad things that you don't want to just uh, remember not to do that. Um, it's going to be impossible to do that. So you could link these together with a link so that they move together, but there's friction between the table and the sides. And so it could just get hung up and fall whichever way it wants, even though the cams were moving together. 
And by the time you're adding links, now this becomes a more cumbersome two-handed operation. And really, with a link in here, it's basically a parallelogram. Except I'm substituting gravity for one of the links. And that's just, it's kind of a crappier version of a parallelogram at this point. What I like about this, though, is that you get, you get control over how much movement there is of an arc here based on the shape of the cam. Whereas with a parallelogram, the, uh, the movement of this arc is only controlled by the length of this link. But if I make that link long enough, there is going to be enough movement in order to have discrete settings. I've been playing around with different cardboard templates of link geometry to see where this arc ends up for a half inch movement of the table. And I ended up with this one, which puts the arc right out here, which is really in the meat of this. The mechanism requires many very accurate holes. Instead of trying to drill them, I'm using a plunge router with a guide bushing and templates. I do drill out the middle of the hole first with a smaller bit because the router bit doesn't plunge very well. I can use the same template by adding a spacer to do the rail that attaches to the table. A different template is used for the links. That seems to be working, so now I can make the curved slot for the lower rod to pass through the side of the joiner. Now, it just worked out that the flange of the bronze bushings that I'm using has the same one inch diameter as the guide bushing. So I can use the same template as a circle cutting guide without having to set anything up other than a couple of clamps as end stops. Without moving the clamps, I could flip the whole thing over and do the other half from the other side and not have to worry about cutting into my table. I want to get as much done as I can on these side panels before assembly, such as making slots so that I can tighten the cutter head bolts. I also need another vertical slot so I can get the bolt in and all. I've done a test fit of the infeed mechanism, and it seems like it works okay. In order to get this in here, though, three of the rods have to go through the case. Uh, so I have to hold it there and get these through. And eventually I'm going to have to do this with the cast iron table on here. So I'm just going to add some stops in here that it can rest on while I get these rods in there. got the cast iron on here now and without any help this moving it up and down from here wasn't too bad but my plan all along was to have some some counterweight on here and I was thinking I was just going to loop it from this shaft up to the fixed shaft here and have a, a weight hanging down but actually the amount of force required was increasing as you get lower so I thought a spring would be a lot better since that force will increase and it's a lot more compact. So this is just a, 
a spring from a desk lamp, and that is enough to make this table just basically float. I don't have this quite right yet. I'm just tinkering at this point. The problem I'm having right now is that these links, these long links, the, I guess I'm going to call that the control link, um, those are able to twist a little bit. I'm, a, I'm applying the force off to one side, and then this is in the middle, so it's twisting a little bit. And I'm hoping that once I tie these two together with a spacer in here and do that really well, that that twist is going to go away. There's a few thousandths of play between the rod and the bushings. Now, if these are right up against each other and you try to move it, you really can't feel much of anything at all moving. But as soon as you spread them out, now there's all kinds of movement here. That's what we're trying to eliminate. Now, the mistake I made was thinking that the only thing that mattered in these links was where the holes were. I didn't worry about the outside shape. But if the outside shape is different, when I try to put these you know, in some kind of alignment to add in a spacer between here, well, I'm going to be building in a twist in here. So I just went and stuck these together and made them the same. Now that didn't really matter with these two because the other way of accomplishing that is with the spacer, you could make the ends of this fit around the rods tightly and that's going to force those rods to be parallel to each other. So that can't twist. But on my other one, I wanted to fully box that in. And so I just, I can't do that with that one. Connecting the links together took care of the twist problem. Now on the outside, this mechanism is going to work just like a miter saw. So you turn this knob and then you can move it. But there'll be a piece here with notches that this engages in. And to disengage it, you just squeeze it and then you can be able to move it and it'll lock into a notch or you can lock it in between just by turning the knob again. So this big pointer is made up of several pieces with opposing rabbits and then a piece that goes on top to lock them all together. And then there's a long slot in the inner part and then a little block gets attached to the sliding part and a spring fits in there and we'll push on that little block. Finally, there's a little mortise for the lever. On the inside, there's a stop that is pinned to the shaft and that gives the knob something to tighten against. And then there's a screw screwed into the link and that keeps the shaft from rotating. The hardest part of all of this was probably cutting the threads on the half inch rod. I ended up having to grind a flat on the shaft to keep it from rotating in the vise. But it all went a lot smoother once I figured out what the little screw in the split die is actually for. Which is opening it up so you can make the cut in several passes rather than trying to do it all at once. I left you hanging about the cutter head. So I got an RMA to send it back and I was getting it packaged up to go back and I thought, let me cover my butt just in case they give me a hard time. And I'll get video of two bearings being loose on the shaft. So I have proof. I have two bearings because the first one I got from Grizzly, I didn't like the sound of it and it just doesn't feel right. So I got a second one from McMaster Car. This is the one that was in the video that is super loose. So I put this one on and it's tighter. It's still, it goes on easier than it should, but it doesn't spin on the shaft. So now I'm thoroughly confused because like, is this bearing the right size? Is this bearing the right size? I don't know. So I got a third bearing, the good stuff, not a sponsor. And it fits perfectly. So all that grief 
and drama just by the good bearings the, the first time. That's my lesson. And I still have my wooden spacer in here. And I'm still confused by this arrangement, but I'm exchanging the poly V-belt uh, pulley for a regular V-belt. This one is a dual. I'm only going to use one belt because this is intended for three horsepower and I'm only using two horsepower. So I think one is going to be fine. What I need to do now to install this is I need to locate where the holes for these bolts go. So I'm going to make a little thing with a pointy end that goes in there. I'm just going to drop it in there and have it leave a mark. Once those bolts are in there, there's no reason to ever take them out again. So I'm gluing a piece on the inside that will restore some of the strength that was lost from making those slots. The motor is bolted to a piece of plywood and my elaborate tensioning system is to use a crowbar and screw it down. All right, let's see what happens.